Edward Lighton once wrote that the pen is mightier than the sword. Well, Eddie, what about the golf pencil? Putting is easy. Look at how many ways you can make putts. Let's see. You can knock it in, bang it in, bounce it in, pour it in, roll it in, dye it in, sneak it in, or be a plumber and drain it. Hell, you can even make a putt by catching the corner of the cup, even though the cup is round and there is no corner. But then again, you can Thurman Munson it and dead yank it. You can push it, pull it, stub it, Mick Jagger it, and lip out, three whip it, three jack it, fan it, or your putter can feign on the backswing. I guess the best we can realize is all we can do is make a good stroke. But wait, what if I make a great stroke but misread the putt? In this game, and in life, you must anticipate adversity. Thus, this year, I have made a commitment to carry my homeowner's insurance card. Actually, I'm legally required to carry proof of homeowner's insurance due to the volume of cars I have struck with golf balls. I don't want to boast, but I am somewhat of a legend within the insurance industry. You see, I have achieved the equivalent of the Grand Slam. Let's see, I have struck the 1982 Cadillac Cimarron, the 1987 Hugo, the rare 1971 Chevy Vega, and the most prized within the insurance industry, the 1976 Ford Pinto. That's right, the exploding car, the 76 Pinto. I will be the keynote speaker at the National Insurance Convention in Reno later this year. And yes, I will have my clubs and I will have my homeowner's insurance card. Golfers, I have one piece of advice for you. Give it up. This game is impossible. For over 125 years, this game has been laughing at us. It's a sick laugh. It's a Keith Richards laugh through a half-smoked cigarette. And when the game does take the time to talk to us, it is like when Keith Richards talks to us. He can't understand a damn thing he says. Let's see, the earth rotates 600 miles per hour in a tilted position, and we are swinging in a completely different tilted position. You've got gravity, centrifugal force, decaying orbit, and I don't have time to get into black holes, string theories, quantum mechanics, or M theory. On top of this, there are over 4,000 possible wrist alignments. Folks, give it up. And we all act like Tony Robbins on Prozac when we declare we are on the verge of break off. I'm on the verge. I'm on the verge. Can we golfers be any more delusional? If I told you Tiger Woods sleeps on a magic fingers bed, you know the ones that used to be in the hotels required a quarter and would shake and shimmy, a million golfers would line up to buy magic fingers bed. We are the most delusional people on the planet. The peak of my career, if that is what you want to call it, was one week. I played decent golf for one week out of 41 years of playing. People ask me, do you ever have a heyday? Yeah, I had a heyday, one week. I walked upright for one week and was the proudest monkey. The verdict soon came in on my Scopes monkey trial, guilty. I'm back on all fours, scraping my knuckles, and dragging a bag heavy with doubt. I beg your pardon. I never promised you a rose. The key mentally to playing good golf is to play in the third person. When you play in the third person, you don't take things personally. You think he hit the ball. He made the putt, or he made a poor swing. Like a mob boss saying, don't take it personally, kid. It's just business. Be like Don Vito Corleone when you play. My advice, men, is to go watch The Godfather for the 161st time, and then go play. And when your wife complains to you that you're playing too much golf, make her an offer she can't refuse, like mowing the grass after your round. Great moments in golf. Number 127, August 1994, Tiger Woods invents the fist pump, thus supplanting the high five as a celebration of choice in the world of golf. Most golfers, when they play, there's way too much internal democracy. 
Most of us, when we play golf, have numerous internal voices and conversations in our head. Decisions are being made by committee, and decisions made by committee tend to be disastrous. Let me put it this way. The Ford Pino was created by a committee. When you play, find a way around those group decisions. If these voices realize they exist in a democracy, that they all have equal input and vote, and that you are even listening, they will sense weakness. When it comes to golf, you have to be like George W. Bush. You have to be the decider. In any organization, if you go high enough, there is one person in charge who makes the decisions. Golfers, be like W and be the decider. In a pinch, if you ask me to name the greatest caddies of all time, in no particular order, I would say Gloomy Gloss, Savage Bob, Sneaky Pete, Roundtree, Dear John, Stateside, Eager Lou, Tap City, Irish Mike, Mr. Magoo, Memphis Slim, Spartacus, Holy Joe, Dr. Sardonicus, Blind Tom, Rube Goldberg, Whatchamacallit, Reed Pete, Big Wave Dave, and Speedway. Mac O'Grady's a tough man. How tough, you ask? Mac and Chuck Norris don't sleep, they wait. Right now, Mac is waiting for Persimmon Woods and Blotta Balls to come back, and he's pissed. Why? You ever have to wait 22 years? Well, Blotta and Persimmon are coming back, and when they do, Mac and I will dominate. And here's a tip from Mac when Persimmon does come back. To polish a Persimmon driver, don't be a cretin and use your towel. Use the natural oils on your face to get a great shine. Kind of like that. Welcome to the Jack Perkins Center for Human Awesomeness. I'm here to make you a better athlete, a better golfer, and quite possibly a better human being. You know, men, many women out there look down upon us because we are golfers. They think golfers are not athletes. They think golfers are not sexy. They think golfers have the athletic ability of guys named Ned. They couldn't be more wrong. I think I just proved golfers are athletes and golfers are sexy. Now men, go out and get yourself some. Class dismissed. For your plain pleasure, the Flying Lady is available in pink and blue. Great Moments in Golf, number 96, September 1995. Jay Haas and Nick Price engage in a parking lot brawl to determine who is the nicest guy on the PGA Tour. The brawl consists of the two of them hurling compliments at each other. There was no apparent winner, although Jay did stagger Nick by saying if courtesy is par for any course, then Nick has made the most birdies in tour history. Moments in Golf, number 56. March, 1951, Tommy Bolt invents club throwing. Sadly, a decade later, Arnold Palmer and television will destroy this underappreciated form of self-expression and great art form. To quote Jim Nance, hello friends, I just made an appointment with an orthopedic surgeon. The other day I finally got around to watching the movie Havana with Robert Redford. In the movie Redford plays a professional gambler who has a diamond stitched into his arm. The idea being no matter how bad things got, he would always have this diamond to fall back on. So I got to thinking, I'm going to do the same, only I'm going to have a golf ball stitched into my forearm. The idea being, no matter how many golf balls I lose, I still have one more golf ball. By the way, it is a title of seven for good luck. The great Jack Nicklaus said that no matter how good a club professional is, he is going to upset, annoy, and otherwise piss off 10% of the membership per year. To all you club professionals out there, I invite you to do the math with me. Let's say you're at a club with a membership of 400. 
of 400 is 40. You're going to piss off 40 members per year. I don't care if you're Gandhi. This is the reality. You've been at the club for 10 years. That is 400 members you have pissed off at one point during your tenure. Basically, that is everyone at the club. Jack calls this the rule of 10 for club professionals. This math is like the magic of compound interest, only in a bad way, and this certainly explains the daily hostility that you experience. My advice to you is to make sure the resume is handy and updated. Good luck. complicate things with too many procedural thoughts. Meanwhile, fear rides shotgun on the bogey train that I own. Actually, fear drives my train and I am riding shotgun. Playing golf phobic is no way to go through life. I stand over the putt and realize this is no way to run a railroad, even though my emotionally distant putter insists everything is Jake. I rustle up enough courage to pull the putter back knowing full well I'm a bogey freak in search of a fix. Disappointment is the inevitable outcome. Man, I love this game. Grady has a dream. He has a dream that he will win the Masters. Mac is leading the Masters by three shots on the 72nd hole and has a four inch putt to win the tournament. You know what club he uses? Three wood. That's right, a three wood. He rifles the persimmon three wood back down the fairway, takes his caddy, and walks the ball 265 yards from the hole. What does he do next? That's right, he declares the ball unplayable, goes back to where he played his last shot, taps the ball in the hole, and the wins the Masters by one shot. Now that is a dream. Great moments in golf. Number 31, September 1939. On a limited budget, Popeye's friend Wimpy takes up golf. He goes to the golf shop and says, I will have a green fee today for which I will gladly pay you on Tuesday. Golfers, as you begin your annual investigation into the golf swing, remember that investigating the golf swing is like investigating the smell. It usually doesn't turn out too pleasant. The golf shop is an important responsibility for the head golf professional. The best selling item in our golf shop is the Squirt. The Squirt is a cross between the Short and of course the Skirt. You combine the two and you get the Squirt. The Squirt is a perfect piece of clothing for those members who are indecisive. Great moments in golf, number 321. June 1999, Dr. Irving Goldman asks his golf professional what time the one o'clock shotgun starts. The golf professional ignores the question. Dr. Goldman quotes Ben Hogan and tells his golf professional he's going to practice because the answers are in the dirt. Dr. Goldman, the golf professional says, as he reaches for a Valium, we are on the mats today. Dr. Goldman, the golf professional says, as he swallows his Valium, the answers today are in the polymers. Oh, Sevy. Oh, Mac. One thing I'm tired of is golf announcers saying a player has to hit a fade. Sometimes you have to be in the mood to hit a fade, kind of like a depressing movie or mariachis. I have two words for you, Johnny Miller. That's right, Johnny Miller shot a 63 in the final round of the 1972 US Open. He had every shot dead straight. There was no shot shaping or peeling it off the bunker or any of that cool tour talk. 
And you know what? Johnny was so good that he was actually annoyed when he had to putt. So send the mariachis off to the next table and take your Betamax copy of Bette Midler's Beaches with you. Fades? Johnny and I don't need no stinking fades, man. Trees swaying in the summer breeze Showing off their silver leaves Great Moments in Golf Number 99, June 1989, David Ledbetter gives the first phone lesson. A divot is overnighted to David by Sir Nick Faldo. David analyzes the divot, calls Sir Nick Collect, and keep the phone lesson is conducted. The lesson was such a success that David would offer Sir Nick a series of six phone lessons for the price of seven. A month later, Sir Nick would win the Open Championship. I have averaged hitting 100 balls per day for 28 years. That works out to over 1 million practice shots. Those million plus golf shots is an energy. The law of conservation states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, and therefore the sum of all energies in the system is constant. However, energy can be converted into something else. What has my million plus practice shots been converted to? Complete and utter disappointment would be the scientific term. I thought sports are supposed to build self-esteem, not destroy it. In the end, the energy of those million plus golf shots was converted to a rather permanent self-loathing. Hey, you want to play tomorrow? Always seem to know when it's time to call Rainy day people don't talk, they just Hello friends, aardvarks are a measuring system where generally four feet equals one aardvark. Are you familiar with the system of measurement? The Germans use it to build their great cars and it is a superior measurement system. For the first time, you can now purchase this laser distance measuring device that gives distances and aardvarks. Take the precision of your game to the next level with true German engineering. Made from German steel, don't be the last to convert to aardvarks in your foursome. Order now. They terminated the greatest annual display of human golf wrecks the PGA Tour Qualifying School. That's right, the Fall Classic is no more. I have three words for you, Mac O'Grady. That's right, Mac O'Grady, who went to Q School 17 times. I'm getting Mac, four pairs of Sands about slacks, five Pickering shirts, six All-Star gloves, a set of Wilson Staff blades, a Tony Pennant persimmon driver, and a 1967 Tommy Armour Silver Scott Potter. We're heading down to Ponte Vedra to meet with the commissioner, and you know what? Mac is pretty pissed off. Why? Mac believes abandoning qualifying school is like abandoning the Mona Lisa. That's why. I'm getting Mac, Dick Mass, Blaine McAllister, and a black 1967 400 horsepower Pontiac GTO convertible, and there's going to be trouble. <laughs> represents a period of golf full of hope, rejuvenation, and enjoyment. For us club professionals, we refer to this 100-day period as the 100-day war. It is 100 days full of doubt, disappointment, disillusionment, and self-loathing as we provide adult daycare to golfers around the country. So golfers, as you enjoy the Memorial Day to Labor Day period, we club professionals are fighting the 100-day war, which has now gone on for over 100 years, which means we have fought two wars, the 100-day war and the 100-year war. We do this by making golf a better game, by answering your questions. What time does the 9 o'clock shotgun start? By dotting your scorecards. And by the way, 
as I seek relief to the end of the day, going through the locker room out to my car, please don't come up to me naked and ask me to take a look at your grip. I'll be there tomorrow. Know that on the verge is more of a state of mind than an actual reality. Before you cross the abyss between being on the verge and whatever exists on the other side, one must become intimate with the game. Intimacy is about showing yourself, all of yourself, not just your beaver cleaver side. So if you're going to be intimate with the game, show all of yourself, including your dark side. How do I do that, golf man? asked the emotionally repressed male. I say play tournament golf. Get under some heat. You get under some heat and the first thing you will abandon is reason. When pressured, there's a constant temptation to move away from reason toward madness. The golf greats welcome this and know that only in madness can one experience the full spectrum of human emotions. Hell, most of the golf greats were a tweak away from being sociopaths. The thing that kept them sane is they never crossed over the abyss from being on the verge to the other side. I quote Joseph Conrad, art is long, life is short, and success very far off. Real problem with sports psychologists. For one thing, this entire pre-shot routine thing has gotten out of hand and is overrated. I have two words for you, Lee Trevino. Lee Trevino would step up to the ball like a man and hit the ball. That was his routine. And you know what? Lee wasn't afraid of any golfer or any leaderboard. Now we have players afraid of looking at leaderboards, scowling so it makes them look mentally tough, going to the yardage book for the fourth time, tugging at shirts and slacks, backing off shots, and reaching for towels when it's 62 degrees out, and acting like they are a point man on a recon platoon in the Mekong Delta circa 1968. Players exude a vague but real paranoia when they play, and it has become painful to watch. It comes down to one thing. Hit the shot and be willing to accept the consequences of the shot. That is what a pre-shot routine is. That'd be four hundred dollars. People often ask me, what are the greatest bag rooms in America? Now, for the first time, we can have a civilized discussion on this very topic. Golf Magazine is proud to announce the first annual list of the top 100 bag rooms in America. With your annual subscription, you will receive the list of the first ever ranking of the top 100 bag rooms in America. But wait, order now and we will also include a list of the top 50 classically designed bag rooms as well as the list of the top 50 greatest modern design bag rooms. I invite you to join me in celebrating the history and tradition that is the bag room. Order today. The death zone for alpine climbers is 25,000 feet. For us golfers, it's four feet. That is when what Tommy Bolt called the thing can really get hold of you. As you ponder the four foot putt and your bleak future, you begin a grim slide toward failure. You actually begin to embrace failure as you make a stroke that is totally unclassifiable. Man, I love this game. The golf world is soft today. I hear players saying making the anchoring of putters illegal. It's not fair. It's not fair, golf man. You know what my dad used to tell me? Fair is where pigs go to compete. They outlawed Sam Snead's straddling the line putting method, even though it was previously used by another player. Why? Because they didn't like Sam Snead. Not fair. Ask Sam Snead about fair. You are playing in the local tournament, and on the first tee, you are nervous. Although you are wearing a $400 pair of slacks and have spent a year's worth of mortgage payments on your golf equipment, you still have an evolutionary choice. 
fight or flight. Since I've never seen a golfer run from the first tee to the parking lot, I assume we all choose to fight. The problem is the fight is with yourself. We choose to fight with ourselves for 18 holes. It's an evolutionary choice and it's a hell of a game. Open has a hilarious premise. 144 players playing a course with fairways that are 15 yards wide. The USGA calls it defining the fairway. The four to six inch rye bluegrass rough has been fertilized and watered. The greens have been double cut for a week and are drier than the Sahara. Throw in the pressure of a major championship and you have a public flogging of the finest players in the world. Don't even criticize the course setup. Saying anything negative and you got yourself a 6.15 a.m. tea time the next U.S. Open. The side effects of playing in the open read like a disclaimer for medication. Possible side effects for the U.S. Open include headaches, nausea, diarrhea, loss of appetite, dizziness, painful urination, rashes, fever, hyperventilation, hair loss, anxiousness, and irritability. But it is nice that they conclude the championship on Father's Day. My favorite club is my trusty old 7-iron. So guess which club I've hit the most poor shots with in my career. That's right, the 7-iron. I can't tell you how many times I've stood in the fairway and the more I look at the shot, the more I'll convince myself the shot calls for a 7-iron when I know the shot is an 8-iron or it's a six iron if I'm debating between the six or a seven. One time I began to reach for the seven and my caddy Speedway has his hand over it. He says, stay away from the seven. It's got an angry look to it. I asked him to move his hand and let me take a look for myself. He says, if I may be so bold to suggest the six. And then goes on some lengthy tangent asking me why there's no longer Charlie horses in sports. I ignore him his conversation and bury the seven in the front bunker. Still, the seven is my favorite club. Great moments in golf, number 191, October 1995. Butch Harmon, never one to mince words or sugarcoat, tells a student that his finish is a useless afterthought. school I will miss you Q school you are the ultimate validation of the works of Charles Darwin Q school you are survival of the fittest with selection adaptation hybrids genetic drift and of course genetic mutations yeah we saw a few mutants at Q school the mutants would return year after year like some manic class reunion of former beauty queens who now weigh 215 pounds. Goodbye, Q School. I will miss you, my beautiful, demented friend of the devil. Game, but at times it is an unrequited love. Sometimes I feel the game is stepping out on me and favoring other players. But then again, I have given up on the game countless times. Let's face it. It's a game ripe with infidelity from both parties. The thing is, the divorce rate in golf is surprisingly low. Most golfers tend to accept an endurance marriage with golf versus a painful divorce. Sometimes pace of play is so slow that it must be measured in geological time. 
you tee off at 9.10 on Saturday in the Paleolithic era, and in geological time, it is now the Mesolithic era. Unfortunately, you are using primitive stone tools that distinguish the Paleolithic era. That must surely explain why the thing in your hand is called a club, and why you've devolved from cro magna man to Java man as you hole out on the 18th hole. Let me tell you about the old days on the PGA Tour. There was no fitness trailer, personal strength coaches, managers, swing coaches, mental coaches, or agents. There was the player, clubs, a ball, and the golf course. Players were independent, and whatever problems they had, they took care of personally and privately. If injured, it was a drugstore cowboy mentality. Hurt or tired, pop a Demerol, a Greeny, Dexamil or Dexedrine, and keep going. Rehab was four hours on the practice range after 36 holes of golf. I have a problem with Rule 27-2A that permits the playing of a provisional ball. It's not that playing the provisional ball that I have a problem with, but having to declare your intentions. You have just hit an awful shot, and you have to tell everyone that you just hit off with shot and you would like to try again. It's like peeing your pants and having to tell everyone you peed your pants and that you need to go to the bathroom. Totally unnecessary. The game can really rob us of our dignity. But then again, the rule book was created by lawyers. Field of astrophysics to mathematically link the hydrostatic equilibrium of a self-gravitating body to the equilibrium and stability of fluid systems by contrasting the order and chaos and the motion of bodies using Born approximation theory and the elementary principles of hydrodynamics and hydromagnetics. I could go on about gender roles and ancient Mediterranean cosmologies, the politics of identity, and Libby's second war, but how do you make sense of a world where Jimi Hendrix opened for the monkeys and a world where I could never cure my slice? You stand over the ball and know there are 1,000 things that can go wrong in the next three seconds. You consider the mathematical impossibilities of the game. The club head goes from 0 to 120 miles per hour in 18 feet. The game requires the precision of fractional mathematics, all the while using an imprecise motion and instrument. There are over 4,000 possible wrist alignments. In the end, it's a cosmic coin toss whether you can play this game or not. Just hit the ball and be happy to be playing. Good evening, members. Many of you wonder why you're not better golfers. Let me explain, from an evolutionary standpoint, you really have no chance. Let's say you're playing in the big tournament at the club, you're nervous, and your heart rate rises above 145 beats per minute, which often, ha which often happens with many of you. Bad things begin to happen above 145 beats per minute. Complex motor functions begin to break down. Greater than 175 beats the cognitive process begins to break down. The forebrain shuts down, and the midbrain, the part of the brain that is the same as a dog, reaches up and hijacks the forebrain. Yes, you'll hear barking out of the Avalonis Club. Blood has withdrawn from the outer muscle layer and is concentrated in the core mass. The evolutionary point of that is to make the muscles as hard as possible to turn them into a kind of armor to limit bleeding. Blood has withdrawn from the outer muscle layer and is concentrated in the core mass. The evolutionary point of that is to make the muscles as hard as possible to turn them into a kind of armor to limit bleeding in the event of injury. This leaves one clumsy and helpless. Kind of like this. Golf number 9, January 1929.
the golf boom begins in the United States. Two additional definitions for the word hack are added to Webster's Dictionary. Hack, to cut or sever with repeated irregular blows. Hack, someone unskilled at something. People often ask me, what are the members like to club? How would you define the average member at the club? Webster's Dictionary defines vagrancy as a person who is idle, has no visible means of support, and travels from place to place. Golf agnostic in the sense that I believe the existence of any ultimate golf realities are unknown or unknowable. Bet you would have liked to have known that before you signed up for that series of lessons with me. I love the game of golf, but at times it's an unrequented love. Sometimes I feel the game is stepping out on me. Let's face it, it's a game ripe with infidelity from both parties. The first tee of any tournament is primitive and Darwinian. The flight instinct takes over. The first priority is to get the hell off the first tee. You don't care if you bone it, duck hook it, or roll the shot. Your driver feels like a Swiss Alp horn, but that is okay as long as you can take quick foot joy flight from the first tee. Your heart rate has increased to 175 beats per minute where bad things begin to happen. You experience tunnel vision, loss of depth perception, general feebleness, and do ineffective things like fight back with your eyes closed. The evolutionary reaction to the heart rate at 175 beats per minute is for the skin to harden, to turn itself into a sort of suit of armor to protect yourself from predators. Good luck. Great moments in golf, number 182. January 2005, Camelia Vijegas is the first golf professional to go horizontal since Walter Hagen's post-victory celebration at the 1921 Open Championship. Great Moments in Golf, number 86. August 1977, Lanny Watkins records the fastest backswing in golf history on his way to victory in the PGA Championship. Test pilot Chuck Yeager calls to congratulate Lanny. My sports psychologist loves to tell me that victory is a process and not an event. I tell him if that is true, then losing is a process and not an event. I tell the good doctor of my particular process of losing. Doc, I said, I started out on bogeys, but soon hit the harder stuff. Double bogeys and triple bogeys. I thought I would paint my masterpiece, but ended up with 18 cups full of regret. The back nine was an environmental disaster. I threw oil all over the back nine. I mean, I was the captain of the Exxon Valdez. Meanwhile, Doc, in between the obscenely crooked numbers that I posted, I was thinking about Ike and Tina Turner, wondering who was the greater wrestler, Andre the Giant or Hulk Hogan, and wondering why milk sales are always used as an example in supply and demand curves. The doctor asked me about the positive, real professional stuff on his part. I tell him after my second triple bogey, my caddy told me there is a nor'easter coming in from the southwest and around could get washed out. Hey doc, how's that for a process? Moments in Golf, number 114, February 1992. Eddie Curd of Lexington, Kentucky dies. Eddie Curd is universally credited with inventing the point spread. Players and caddies alike hold vigil on the north course at Torrey Pines in honor of the great Eddie Curd. The over under for the funeral service is two hours. Great moments in golf. Number 101, May 1995, Corey Pavin holds a press conference to deny a former career as a porn star. 
He also fends off questions if he is indeed John Hall of the pop group Hall & Oates. Ironically, one month later, Pavin would win the United States Open Championship at Shinnecock Hills. Let me tell you about a very famous caddy named Rocky. Rocky is a perfectly well-adjusted man from the streets of Philadelphia. Well, as well-adjusted as someone from Philadelphia can be. Rocky is caddying for this guy, and they have a long shot over water on a par three. Rocky wants the player to hit a four iron. The player wants to lean on a five. The player wins and pulls out a five. He tees up the ball and is just about to make a swing when Rocky steps in. Rocky reaches down and picks up the ball. He looks at the ball and says, hold your breath. He puts the ball back and steps aside. That is Rocky. Great Moments in Golf, number 168, March 1971. Killer, caddy for Raymond Floyd is in the prime of his career. Upon reading a putt for Raymond, Killer pronounces that he is 90% sure the putt could break to the left, could break to the right, or could roll dead straight. Two holes later, on a par five, he tells Raymond it's going to take three good ones to get there in two. So you're out there, and things are going bad. Play is slow. You teed off in the Paleolithic era, and in geological time, it is now the Mesolithic area. What do you do? One simple thought. What would Chuck Norris do? Chuck Norris uses diesel instead of milk on his cereal. Chuck Taylor wears Chuck Norris all-star sneakers. Fear itself fears nothing by Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris can split an atom with his bare hands. Think about it. Hello. I am developing a revolutionary swing theory that seamlessly combines the philosophy of L. Ron Hubbard the wisdom of the Cherokee Indians, the writings of Sylvia Plath, and mathematical research based on exhaustive research at the University of Chicago. When you are young, your vision is good. You see things clearly. As you get older, your vision isn't as good things tend to become hazy and distorted. Most of your life, you want your vision to be farsighted. You want to be able to see your hopes and dreams when they're far away. I could see them when I was younger, but I didn't have the skill level. Now, I possess the skill level, but my vision has changed to nearsighted. I can't see my hopes and dreams anymore, even though I'm closer than ever to them. Still, I persevere. Great Moments in Golf, number 115, December 1982. After 17 failed attempts, Mac O'Grady qualifies for the PGA Tour. He promptly goes to a sporting goods store and purchases 17 bats, and that evening returns to the TPC at Sawgrass. In an exercise in catharsisism, he writes the month and the year of every Q school he's ever been to, and then promptly breaks all 17 bats. So after nine years, I give you this. I do not like them, Sam I am. I do not like green eggs and ham. Would you like them here or there? I would not like them here or there. I would not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. Good night and good luck.